try to suppress it and deny mm. it and move away from it for you know for years and years consciously unconsciously it was still there mm. so I think my yeah my connection came through the dream world just by reconnecting you know when I had my eyes closed and then I tried to reconnect and I have my eyes open mm. so this happened after the surgery is that what you're saying the, the dreams started coming in after the surgery it got stronger after the surgery oh, before the surgery. yeah i just ignore them before before i was just like yeah yeah i'm too busy whatever <laughs> so were they do you think they were premonitions or yeah there were premonitions there were premonitions around stuff like um even before the surgery i had to like really significant spiritual experiences where like i was just jumping around the earth and there was another really interesting like like uh, another like lucid dream experience where um i went out into like the cosmos and it's like i was you know about 26 at the time so i didn't have the vocabulary or the grounding to to really integrate that stuff at the time it was just too ungrounded so it wasn't until years later that you realized what they actually were. Yeah, and I started paying attention. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because... So you... Yeah, go on. Um, I'm just curious, have you learned along the way, um, I guess, different skills or ways to approach and um, integrate and process those dreams or you know, do you have to take particular actions? Um. Yeah, because I studied like Ken Wilber. So I studied a little bit of transpersonal psychology, but it was still in the head. So that stuff was still in the mind. So I think with yoga, I was like, okay, now I have to bring it into the body. Now I have to bring it into my heart and my uh, my ground, like my womb and kind of bring it down, bring it down to the earth, bring it down to the earth because we can close our eyes and have the most amazing lucid dreams, the most amazing um, astral realities, but at the same time we have to live in this day-to-day reality mm. or we have to wake up and go to work and, you know, make money. Yeah. So, yeah, and, like, I think we just learn through yoga to become that bridge between the 3D, you know, like the day-to-day grid and groundhog day and the... Uh, higher higher realms Mm. yeah yeah so for you yoga really was that key of integrating yes yes and opening my heart and opening expanding and opening my heart and learning that i don't have to be liked by everyone people don't need to like me i don't have to please everyone so it's always a lifelong lesson of different things not only the physical not only the physical practice Mm yeah did you have any particular sources of inspiration around your spiritual journey your growth Mm. journey um i had many sources of inspiration there was a few people that i fell out with um because i feel like some people in that kind of spirituality um business they can be denying their shadow so they just feel like i am all love and light but they're very ungrounded so i've had like extreme inspirational moments where i've worked with people and they've taken me into greater expansion but i've also had greater disappointments where people just became envious and jealous and started projecting their own stories onto my um my reality Mm. yeah which is both both are the lesson both of them are good yeah so you've really taken, you know, those lessons from both of both of those sides. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's it, it, like for me this whole thing around, you know, when I first became a yoga teacher, I really wanted to be liked, and I'll be disappointed if someone didn't like my class or left um, angry or walked out. And um, now it's like, and it's always that lifelong journey, like yoga is an offering. Some people want the offering. Some people are not going to like you for whatever reason, maybe. Mm. And this is a joke, but maybe you've killed their mother in a past life. <laughs> it's like, they're not going to like you. And it's, it's more like, okay, I don't need to be liked. Some people are going to like block you and delete you from Facebook because you've been a bitch to them. And that's okay. Self-acceptance, self-love. I, can say, I accept 
the part of me that can that can be a bitch to people and be insensitive and be uncaring and unkind but there's you know there's more there's always more and they can judge me and that's okay too mm. yeah that's something i really admire about you you're you always have this ability to step back and reflect and just bring everything back in and learn from it and then you move forward i think it's beautiful mm. um, thank you yeah no worries thank you <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's because like I have a tendency to go into my head and over rationalize things, um, and that can be a defense because I can use psychology as a way of over rationalizing things, and because I'm also super sensitive, so I feel a lot. But when I feel there's a negative energy coming in, I try to clear it and transform it, and I over rationalize it. So, but I'm trying to bring it down from the mind back into the heart, back into the heart, and then transmute it. Because I could over-rationalize things to death, you know, that's kind of my job. But I need to kind of use that emotional and the energy side to transform it and transmute it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and how has your, your learning in yoga changed the way that you, um, you know, that you're a psychologist? Mm-hmm. It's changed so much and it keeps changing because if I am working with people and I'm taking in a lot of stuff and I did this beautiful practice on the weekend with uh, my teacher called the Tonglin practice where you breathing in is Pema Chodron. I think she, she does this meditation where you breathe in all of the darkness, all of the crap, all of the samsara, all of the suffering, all of that pain and you breathe out love. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're breathing in all of that, you know, suffering, and you breathe out love, and it's a Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, and it's and it's that breathing in. But for me, sometimes when I go to my mat and I've been working with people who are suffering, not trying to fix them, I just acknowledge suffering is there. And when I'm on the mat, I will connect to myself, connect to my heart, come back into my own energy field. Mm. And in Shavasana, I let it all go. I let it all go. I just, mm. just let it all dissipate because dissipate cause the stories and everything is bigger than me. I'm only doing mm. a small, small part. It feels like such a small part. Mm. Yeah, mm. I think that's... Um you know, something that a lot of people who are in a position where they're helping others, um, you know, they struggle with that, taking on, you know, other people, especially if you're empathetic and you're really sensitive to that um, and needing to make sure you have an outlet for that and you're able to balance it and look after yourself. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's also the issue of... Um, secondary trauma as well which is um quite big so how i mean do you i guess uh, protect yourself Mm -hmm. energetically as well while you're um while you're Mm -hmm. with your clients i love that question no no i i (laughs) no i don't (laughs) um Uh, I go in full I go full in I go like all in and then when I'm there I'm like almost like completely in and the way I look um, is different the way I tune in is different the way I am is different I'm completely there for that person I'm also listening differently so I'm listening as me but I'm listening um, like I've got another hat on Mm -hmm. Um, once that person leaves if I'm still carrying something because sometimes before I knew any of those practices I used to take everything home Um, but then I kind of there's like little acupressure points that I'll press if I'm still carrying stuff Uh, maybe I have a bath maybe I'll have a shower so there's things that I do afterwards but when I go in I'm just 100 percent 100 percent there I don't I don't feel like I need to protect myself Mm. which is interesting before I used to I used to be like oh my god you know I just need to because I've seen I've felt so like I felt like a lot of darkness before in um in sessions and I felt like oh this blue light around me um but now I'm just a hundred percent there Mm. And I can trust. I can trust myself to come back to myself if if I get lost in the stories and the energy. Yeah, well, that's really powerful to know within yourself that you can do that as well. Have that grounding. 
And it's catching myself as well because sometimes I do feel like I'm anxious and it's not my stuff or I'm sad and I'm depressed and uh, and it's not my stuff. It's someone else's stuff that I might be uh, processing with them and assisting them. And But, you know, who's healing who? Who's healing who at the end yeah. of the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah they help me so much i learned i learned so much from working with people yeah wow that's really powerful and it's really i guess humble of you to be able to recognize that as well yeah yeah you know i come home and sometimes like if i'm tired i'm just thinking to myself like what did i learn today i've learned about this part of me that's really afraid of my husband leaving me i've i've seen this part of me that's really you know terrified about having kids and i've seen this part of me so i'm actually really learning so that mirror process of um working with someone else mm. yeah it's interesting we all won <laughs> yeah so do yeah. you feel that this is a, a big part of your own, your path and your, your own growth? Yes. And it's, I'm also like, if I'm teaching yoga, I'm really playful. So it's for me to be a really serious teacher, it feels inauthentic. And mm. if I'm working with people, it's like, I'm just really authentic and I'm me. But um, it's something I've always been really curious in working with people. It's something that I fell into because, um, you know, I was a very shy kid and I wanted to figure people out and what, what are human beings about? What are they doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? So it is part, part of my path and my dharma and my growth because it's always been there. It's always something I was, you know, it doesn't feel like it's a job. It just feels like it's an art. It feels like it's an art. It's mm-hmm. like, well, let's, let's dance for a bit and I'll get fully interested and immersed in you. And then when we leave, you know, you're going to continue to dance with someone else and then we're both going to be changed and transformed wow. by the experience. I love that imagery. Are you able to elaborate a little bit of that? The art? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I know sometimes I get a lot of slack from my peers, like, well, psychology is a science and, you know, you should have this numbers measuring this or that. But for me, it's an art. (laughs) It's like, it's the art of relating. You go into that relationship and you both become completely transformed. Because if you're looking at something, that thing or that person that you're looking at gets transformed by your gaze, and you'd be transformed by the person's, you know, opening their hearts to you and trusting you with things they haven't trusted the partner or the person they love with, you know, like it's a real privilege and it's an honor for someone to share the deepest, darkest secrets with you. Mm. And and for you to hold that, hold that and, and expand it and, and reflect back and then and, and give it back and it's collaboration. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? What would you like to do about this? Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's a beautiful art of language and relating and this energetic dance of, um, you know, beings that feel like we're very separate, but we connected, we are one, part of one and going mm-hmm. back to one. But, we you know, just exploring what it's like to be human and all of those different polarity dualities and dance and darkness and suffering and stories and projections into the futures and traumas to do with the past. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's beautiful. Mm. <clears throat> um, yeah, I love how you, I, yeah, how you describe that whole, that whole imagery, but the, can we come back to that, mm-hmm. um, that mm-hmm. art of relating? I'm just really interested to, I guess, look a bit mm-hmm. deeper into that, that yes. relationship. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, let me give an example, but I have to give an example that's really abstract. Um, yeah, of course. mm -hmm. (sighs) Um, okay. I'll go back to the past a long time ago, a long time ago. I worked with someone who was schizophrenic and he was schizophrenic in a way that his mind kind of fragmented because of the trauma he had to go through as a child but I didn't know about the trauma I didn't know about the story because he couldn't verbally express it but I also at the time I didn't have the tools that I have now so he'll come in and I'll learn you know what it's like for dogs to talk to you what's like for the birds to be laughing at you you know what's like to feel like you were Satan one day and the next day you'll be Jesus so <laughs> And uh, like he was amazing because he was able to ex- like to explain the mind of a schizophrenic that fragmented because of that trauma. 
And I was, you know, coming in and I was take a step forward and maybe he'll take a, take, a, take a step back. Maybe he'll take two steps forward and I'll take a step back. So we're doing this dance together to figure out how to move forward in the sense of, okay, so this is what's, that's, this is the play. This is what you're experiencing. This is what I'm experiencing through sitting here with 